Buongiorno. Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, conference, Italy Europe Development. I will introduce the topic before introducing our guests. So let's say that we have two main vantage points for this conference. First of all, we're going to talk about a number of issues through the lens of through the lens of development. So next year we're going to celebrate 30 years from the fall of the Berlin Wall and something has happened because the countries of Europe that at that time were third world India, Korea, Vietnam, China, South Africa, Brazil today are countries whose GDP grows uh, with two digits. That means that if Italy and Europe do not uh, move ahead, Italy and Europe will become uh, poorer and poorer. Well, we do not believe, believe in the degrowth, in the happy degrowth. You cannot pay for solid wages, you cannot pay for pensions, you cannot pay for subsidies for the disadvantaged people, you can do anything because before distributing uh, money and wealth, uh, you need to earn money. Otherwise, uh, you just contribute to inflation, 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 inflation by 1,000%. Say, first and foremost, uh, Italy and Europe has to have to do something. Well, it's not our fault directly, but if we do not do anything, we're going to be loser in the development arena. So we have to do something. The second big issue is the following. So with respect to 70, 60 years ago, there is a, a comeback of populism, nationalism. And after the end of the Second World War, leaders from the world, including Mitterrand and Kohl, and before them, Adenauer and Gasperi, reconstructed, together with Jean Monnet, Europe, overcoming nationalism with the idea that the only way out was to build Something together, first of all, with the European community of uh, coal and steel, and then little by little by setting up a supranational body. And now, after quite some time, after the enlargement of Europe, because and there was a bit of a sort of uh, disappointed because actually it didn't uh, make Europe really stronger. So. We are still back to economic wars, plays on European institutions and migrants, Eastern countries claiming to be nationalist. Then we have parties in the Western parts of Europe that state and declare they do not believe in European interrogation. And despite that, they win uh, elections. So, well, it's something that is not neg negligible at all. We need to consider that. And then we have uh, young people moving around. We have uh, uh, cultural flaws, tourist flaws, study flaws, for instance, Erasmus students. And we have uh, uh, flaws of scientists and workers and companies. So, today's Europe is different from when I was younger. It's different from of uh, the past, when I was younger, I went to London with my parents. You had uh, to sort of um, cross the channel and uh, then always with a passport. Today with Ryanair, you go to London just for the weekend uh, with less than 100 euros and uh, foreign languages are, say, widespread and common. Say, it's almost harder to tell young people that in the past we were divided. And uh, we have uh, 
major research centers, one in Switzerland, uh, CERN, then we have uh, space-related European projects. We have so much in common, energy policies. So that's why we have to talk about uh, the Europe and uh, Italy of the future. Well, to do so, I think we have the best possible speaker ever. We have uh, Mr. Antonio Tajani, President of the European Parliament, a sort of uh, friend of the mating. He has been a friend for such a long time. We have Enzo Moavero Milanesi, Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, a regular and welcome guest of the mating. He's joined us several times. And then Luis Miguel Poyares Maduro, Director of the Global Governance Program and Professor of Law at the European University Institute and former Portuguese minister and uh, member of European institutions, another sort of uh, welcome and usual guest of the meeting. So I give the floor to uh, Mr. Maduro, who is going to moderate uh, this uh, conference. First of all, I would like to thank the Mating Foundation for inviting me here. It's the fourth time I come. It's always a great pleasure to be here with you. And uh, in particular, I'm happy to be here to moderate and promote the debate between two people that I admire and respect a lot. And I had the chance to no, beforehand, uh, I had the opportunity and I said it to Mr. Tajani when he was the uh, vice president of the Barroso Commission. And uh, I had my political experience at that time. And uh, we were colleagues and friends with uh, Mr. Moaver in Luxembourg because we were uh, both members of the Court of Justice of the European Union. So, well, I'm so happy because we are not a, a sort of professional politicians. So we have been working in the political world in not easy times. So it's a great opportunity for me also to wish all the best to both Mr. Tanyan and Mr. Moaver, in particular to Mr. Moaver, considering his role. So I will ask some questions. And uh, I will introduce some of the topics we're going to debate. The first one is the governance reform of Europe, the relation between Europe and its member states. So, so Greek, sorry, Greece has finally left sort of uh, the specific uh, umbrella that had been uh, sort of foreseen for countries in need. So Greece got more than 300 billion financial aid from the other member states. So I have a first uh, question about this to our guests. So, What can we say about these programs of uh, financial support and protection? Because on the one hand, there was a major social cost. But on the other hand, thanks to these uh, bailout program, Greece could get out of a serious uh, financial sort of crisis, but with some also political issues, a bailout program has been key for Greece, and it is very important to get out of such a difficult situation. And it's hard now to go back to some credibility on the market, and especially by European partners. So we live in an interdependent world, and credibility is key for any member states. And this leads to sort of a big challenge. 
because uh, national governments and national politicians also have uh, to sort of dare to adopt uh, austerity measures, and this is not always possible. How can you do that? Because otherwise, there's just a political transfer of responsibilities. It says member state should uh, sort of become owner of these programs and manage them politically and manage also the related uh, uh, problems. My second question is, which is the relationship between this issue and the deeper euro reform? Because the European Union was able to overcome the economic crisis, but unfortunately, the trust between member states has gone down. One of the biggest issues today is to be able to somehow uh, mitigate and reduce to the minimum the uh, democratic difference between countries because, of course, sometimes there are different needs. And so with the Eurozone, this is particularly visible. We have those uh, who want a functioning Euro and uh, want sort of a more sharing of the risk through banking Europe no, or euro bonds or more flexibility. And on the other hand, we hear countries and people that say that we have to have more rigor, less risk sharing, more responsibility by each member state to, to avoid creating a more risk issue among member states. So how can you, we make these two political souls go hand in hand, especially when it comes to the future of Euro and Europe? So risk sharing between and among member states and solidarity that that entails. And on the other hand, the flexibility of uh, national economic policies. They say, is either or, is it possible maybe to find a compromise? These are my initial questions. President Tajani, you first, and then uh, uh, Mr. Marlborough. Okay, so first, Mr. Marlborough, perfect. Thank you, thank you, Luis. Well, if we want to talk about uh, the period after the economic crisis and uh, Euro means uh, talking about two major pillars uh, of uh, the uh, build of the European construction because when these uh, sort of uh, policies uh, were designed, uh, they were thought to be very promising and successful. Many people looked uh, with interest and hope and with uh, a lot of positivity to the launch of the Euro. And then many people just got disappointed and uh, shifted uh, to the sort of no Euro camp. So what uh, could have done uh, better? How can we improve? Uh, the situation and what can we reform. So the euro currency uh, was born like a sort of original sin because uh, there is actually very little risk sharing. So sharing the same currency without sharing its uh, risks uh, well, considering that uh, the involved state uh, to keep their uh, economic sovereignty is uh, a sort of hazard when it comes to setting up a new reality. Probably this is the reason why, well, from the uh, signature of the treaty, uh, of the Maastricht Treaty, setting up the European and Economic Union, we still keep talking about its reform. So. 
until things have been good, these problems have uh, remained uh, in the background. But then, thanks to the strength of the euro, some countries improved their situation. Some countries uh, had a positive periods with low interest rates. Uh, so mortgage taxes were lower if you wanted to buy a house. And the same happened to companies, and that was even more important. So generally speaking, the all in all repercussions were good. But for many production systems that were used to a weak currency, let's think about ourselves, for instance, well, that meant a big, big competition challenge because well, the advantage that could come from uh, the inflation and evaluation of the currency was not there anymore. So the commercial challenge was even harder without that lever. And so, uh, I mean, other levers had to be found. Those industries that were able to get reinforced on uh, international markets also in absolute terms were able to survive the others just got weaker and weaker and it was a first element that somehow upset us but it was beneficial to other players well you can think whatever you want of germany but it's the first manufacturing power europe we are the second manufacturing power and it goes without saying that uh, in general terms the quality of uh, german products uh, has reached such a high and good level of reputation, sometimes exceeding our products. So another element that has to be considered is globalization. Globalization made the world so much more competitive. Vitadini said that global scenarios and balances are changing. I'm always so much struck by a statistic figure. According to some estimates, uh, by 2030, 2035, no European state uh, will rank among uh, the f first seven economies of the world. So certainly that means that our size is not right, but even the common size uh, presents with problems because uh, the economic uh, and financial crisis was an unexpected shock that had uh, a big impact uh, on some uh, sort of uh, specific issues and uh, we took some time to find a way to overcome the crisis and fortunately the crisis has been overcome at world level but uh, the crisis past period increased the level of inequalities of asymmetries inside countries, between countries, and unfortunately, solidarity and uh, moreover, mutual help has gone down. We are talking about the Eurozone reform, if we really want to use the lingo that is often used by the media. So this Eurozone reform goes through some uh, ideas that are very popular in the debate, but also goes through some specific pragmatic uh, proposals that so uh, were presented by the European Union in December last year. But in my opinion, while well, these proposals are quite shocking because uh, on the one hand, we have uh, a proposal of directive that should uh, implement and uh, make uh, more human the so-called fiscal compact that uh, sets forth uh, some constraints and rules uh, sort of reinforcing some already existing uh, mechanisms. But if we have a look at the proposal of the Commission, for instance, we see that there are fewer uh, derogation opportunities that are still given by the current system, so you would have fewer those that allow the so-called flexibility. And so the whole focus moves from the 
switch of uh, yearly deficit to the public debt. And this is not a good piece of good news for us, but also for Europe in general, because during the crisis, there was an increase in the uh, average quantity of public debt. And even if we, uh, when it comes to the proposals of the Commission, there is no proposal about possible mechanisms likely to put sanctions on the excess of uh, commercial sorts of uh, gain that one country may have uh, with respect to the others. This is considered as uh, an element uh, that may generate imbalance, but actually there is no sanction. I mean, this is a, a, a tool that creates uh, imbalance. So there was a proposal about uh, the bailout program, and um, in particular, there was also a sort of uh, Europe, the proposal to create a European monetary fund or a special uh, uh, bailout program for banks, uh, for weak banks. Well, we are talking about 700 billion euros that have been capped uh, to, to sort of to, to, as a reserve for member states in difficulty. So now there's a question about using this money as development funds. But this alternative is not uh, considered as such, not for now. So when we talk about Eurozone reform, actually, we do not, we do, not do nothing at European level but tracing back those uh, pathways of uh, roles uh, setting that are mostly concentrated in state policies. Instead, I think we should concentrate much more on real economic European policies likely to boost economic drivers and likely to uh, sort of support and promote uh, economic development. And that could be possible by creating a European economic policy and not having single member states economic policies to be controlled and double checked and verified. So if we sort of leave these competencies to states and you need to check that they spend well, they spend not too much and so on, that brings about too much complexity. And then I have a final consideration about the budget of the European Union that should be a major development lever. So actually, this budget is rather small. It accounts for 1% of uh, the sort of uh, raw income of the Union. It matches the GDP of the European Union. It's 1%. It is true that uh, the United States are a federation but for them, uh, this rate accounts for 24%. So between 1% and 24%, there's a huge, huge gap that is self-evident, even though we consider that we are not a federation. But still, what is uh, more serious is that uh, the budget of the EU is 40 times smaller than the compound of the budgets of the uh, member states, so the EU can spend uh, up to 40 times less than what uh, its member state uh, uh, spend altogether. So asking for vigorous actions by the EU to carry out economic development, uh, to deal with the migrants, uh, to have uh, the common agricultural policy, the defense policy, to promote international cooperation for development policy, it's very, very hard. So we will need uh, to equip the EU, uh, as it happened in the history of the US, as soon as they became more and more consistent at the federal level, we may consider creating European taxes. Nobody likes the word taxes. But if we consider that uh, there are today players that somehow sort of uh, pay fewer taxes by changing and switching countries, so they sort of uh, are successful in that. So having European taxes that uh, make those uh, that work in continental Europe pay the same as others, uh, that could be a good solution. Finally, another remark, maybe this is uh, thought-provoking, not with you specifically, but somewhere else with other interlocutors. 
I think that it would not be an original sin to think about uh, European bonds. Uh, well, the very, very limited level of uh, European debt of 4% uh, would uh, generate five times as much the current uh, resources available for the Union. So if we do really believe in Europe, in the reform of the Eurozone, and in this system in general, we need to uh, sort of make these uh, leap. Otherwise, we will simply sort of put a patch in it and then sort of contribute to the disgregation of the EU. We have to do our best uh, because uh, the uh, EU is uh, uh, slowly collapsing. Europe, as it is now, is not working. It is too far away from citizens. Um, we don't know where politics is. And when politics is missing, there's no vision, there's no strategic vision. What is the goal of Europe? Where do we need to go with this kind of Europe? And how can uh, Europe uh, be turned into uh, one of the major leaders uh, uh, worldwide uh, in the era of globalization? And so Moavero, Moavero is absolutely right uh, when he says uh, what would, all, what would Italy or France or Germany alone be worldwide? We would be uh, nothing against the other giants like Russia, the US, China or India. However, uh, a European vision is uh, much needed. Europe has to become protagonist once again. The major reform is to go back to politics, because when politics is missing, then European institutions are very far away from citizens. The bureaucracy, red tape, manages um, a uh, uh, something manages like a car. Maybe it's a Ferrari, so it's a beautiful car, but there's no pilot, there's nobody driving it. And uh, the driving force must be a political one connected to some values, because first of all, you have values, and then uh, politics comes after values, because the founding founders uh, of the new uh, European Union, because uh, Europe was not born uh, in the, uh, uh, after the Second World War, because Europe is our culture, is our cradle, is our civilization, and it has always been so. We've, we are all Europeans because we are Italians. Thousands of years of common history join us, and also Christian history, because uh, what connects us when we go to Vilnius or Lisbon or La Valletta or Prague is a crucifix uh, that can be found everywhere. It's, uh, you don't just find it in Italy. So these are common roots that should not be forgotten. One of the most important aspects in politics uh, is the uh, macroeconomic uh, policy and the uh, policy connected to the uh, uh, euro, which is a tool uh, to make choices. And let's go back to values. What is our value? Uh, and what is our model in all that? Our model is uh, a market economy. The market must be supported because it produces wealth which in turn must be distributed. The entrepreneur is a tool for producing wealth and well-being to all others. Hence, a common currency is needed for Europe, which must safeguard each one of its 500 million citizens. The euro is not a dogma, not a goal. It is just a tool to implement a good economic policy to the service of citizens. 
Has this result been achieved? I don't think so. However, that does not imply that the euro should be destroyed or Italy should get out of the euro because it would be much worse than today. It would be an enormous damage. When uh, I hear stupid things by somebody saying, let's go back to the lira or to our national currencies, I think about what that would imply for all our SMEs uh, to go back to the euro and uh, have to pay uh, their debts uh, with the new uh, currency. And the states will have to pay uh, their debts in euro anyway. However, a reform of the Eurozone is needed so that the Euro can um, uh, help uh, uh, citizens, can be to the service uh, uh, of citizens. And since the macroeconomic policy must be to the service of uh, uh, microeconomic policies, uh, as in entrepreneurs producing wealth for the rest of the population, a government is needed. And a governance of the common currency is needed. This is going to be one of the reforms. It's going to be difficult, but a debate, I think, has to be launched. Otherwise, there's no vision. Politics should have a vision. We should have a European Central Bank able to govern the uh, uh, common currency, to devaluate uh, when needed, when there is a trade war, for example, and best protect the interests of the economy and of the 500 million European citizens. We needed to accomplish uh, the uh, banking union today. We're halfway through. But without that, uh, the reform risks causing damage. An assessment is also needed on the six pack. An assessment is needed on the bail in. Everyone says uh, it was a big mistake. Uh, we need to get out of that. Maybe this is true, but I remind you that when the bail-in was introduced, everyone was against the bail-out. And when I was saying, oh my God, the government uh, is making us pay taxes on house uh, to uh, uh, save a bank, so why should the citizens uh, uh, pay? We no longer want a bailout, we want to change. So we need to understand what we want. At that time, nobody knew the meaning of bail-in or bail-out, apart from experts. So an assessment is needed on that, as well as on the Eurozone. What are its benefits? What correction measures must be implemented? Tax harmonization, for example, is one of the needed corrective measures because uh, money uh, in a country cannot uh, uh, have uh, uh, a certain price and have a different price in another country. Otherwise, the first country should not be competitive. That would jeopardize uh, the uh, uh, principle of competition. If there are differences between the cost of currency and money between Germany and Italy, well, that would jeopardize competition rules. So I mentioned the European Central Bank acting as a bank. Unfortunately, in recent years, there was a sort of supervisory body of the European Central Bank trying to replace the politics and politicians. And an enormous damage was being caused, was about to be caused to Italian banks when this super, supervisory body uh, uh, wanted to uh, clean up deteriorated credits, uh, abusing its power of supervision. And I prevented that from happening. When I hear people in Brussels saying that uh, the European Parliament has blocked the technocrats uh, uh, of the supervisory body of the European Central Bank to defend banks that need to issue loans. I hear uh, a lot of gossip, a lot of words, but no, I see no facts. 
because it's up to the legislators to issue and to issue rules even in the macroeconomic context. I also agree with Moavero when uh, uh, he talks about uh, euro bonds. We can have a formula for that because the economic and uh, uh, financial system uh, cannot just go to the profit to the advantage of one single member state because if we live in a community, it has to go to the, the advantage of the community as a whole. The sum of the, of the advantages at the end of the day must be the same for each single country. There has been an objective advantage for Germany, for example. But Germany had this advantage and still has many objective advantages because oftentimes Italy has not been able to play the role it should have played uh, in uh, European uh, fora. Italy was lacking too many interviews on television, but it didn't participate in European fora. And I have to praise Enzo Moavero because when he was uh, a minister for uh, uh, EU policies, uh, He was always there. He was always present. I wish everyone was like him. I wish. Unfortunately, Enzo Mojavero was an exception. This is not connected to uh, 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 political right or uh, political left. Uh, this is a national trend because in Italy, it's much more important to have an interview on television than to achieve uh, practical results. And I don't think we can achieve practical results, uh, even on migration, saying, uh, I'm no longer paying, I'm not going to give money, uh, because uh, uh, this is just uh, uh, a demonstration of uh, strength, but false strength, leading to uh, an opposite result. Uh, Italian citizens uh, will pay a price they don't deserve paying. I believe that um, a battle should be waged in order to increase the European budget. Because uh, there can be uh, many returns for our country, too. For example, let's think about what we can do in terms of research and innovation and in terms of the uh, uh, European agricultural policy or for migration. We need to fight to protect uh, national interests uh, within uh, the uh, community budget 2021-2027. But you need to be there. You need to be present. You need to defend uh, 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 your stances, uh, not by making interviews on television. You need to be there to discuss, uh, to convince others to achieve results. Because the most important thing uh, is not just uh, uh, being high on the high on top of the surveys, but it is the practical results, uh, which can only be achieved uh, if you work, uh, which is much harder than uh, having an interview on television or uh, writing on Facebook uh, or uh, releasing a tweet. Working is much harder, but those who are elected and represent the people have the duty to fight not for their own image, but to fight for the people that have chosen them, have their representatives. This is the only way to change things. In order to answer the uh, first question that was asked, uh, uh, fortunately, the season of the Troika has come to an end. The representatives are telling you what you have to do, uh, maybe in a very arrogant way, something I do not really like. Like, uh, uh, for example, I didn't like uh, uh, when I was at school, I was not very polite, and I was sent out of the uh, um, room, but uh, 
Was it my fault or was it the teacher's fault? It was my own fault. And I don't want the Troika to come here to Italy because we've not been able to uh, manage our finances. However, with no economic policy, with no vision, we can but lose credibility. With no economic policy reducing public debt and focusing on growth, on infrastructures, uh, enabling us to pay uh, the uh, previous debts of the public administration, uh, 60, 70 billion euros, with no reform of social justice, uh, with no reduction in bureaucracy, uh, the uh, state debt, the national debt, uh, is going to increase enormously. And that would be a, a risk if we don't have a vision as Italians, uh, as a country, Italy, uh, we risk having a major crisis in our finances. I don't like the Troika. I don't like people coming and telling me uh, what we should do. It is unacceptable for me. This is why we need to show that we are uh, credible. There's uh, a community uh, which is going to uh, pay for my own responsibilities. And we don't want to pay for other people's uh, uh, responsibilities and, fall, and faults. But uh, that should be uh, uh, a mutual concept. I don't believe in austerity, in rigor, in uh, uh, economic policy, uh, um, uh, imposing uh, too many taxes on citizens. Uh, I do believe in an economic policy based on, on growth, uh, on a reduction of uh, fiscal pressure. My vision uh, is uh, far from the Anglo-Saxon one uh, or the one imposed by Germany. I do uh, believe in the homo faber, in uh, a uh, Christian vision of uh, man, uh, building up. I do not believe in punishment. But if our primary goal is to create employment, jobs, uh, an economic policy, a real economic policy is needed. To conclude, uh, I didn't say something about the budget, uh, which to me is of the utmost importance. In Europe, there can no longer be major companies uh, doing whatever they want, uh, conveying uh, true messages and uh, false messages, uh, showing uh, uh, whatever they want to, and uh, uh, causing damage to the copyright without paying taxes and without complying with the law and the rules. I firmly believe that there must be a tax for the uh, web giants that cannot come to Europe and that cannot do whatever they want while earning a lot of money to then uh, take them to China or the United States. And maybe to uh, create sites destroying our European civilization. Maybe because uh, the other countries of the world uh, want to reduce the European power. Fake news are directed from somewhere, and Italy should pay a lot of attention to fake websites uh, to fake profiles uh, because there are many, far too many. Those who don't want uh, rules for the web are those uh, using the web in order to influence the public opinion with fake news, uh, trying to manipulate democracy and the public opinion. This is not acceptable. So a web tax uh, would enrich the European Union, uh, would increase uh, the European budget, uh, 
and many more things could be done to the interest of citizens and fewer things to those who want to manipulate the citizens' mind. Mind. Thank God we're free men and women and we'll do our best for this not to happen. Now, uh, uh, before talking about the second topic, uh, following up to what uh, uh, Mr. Moavero has just said and the need for new resources, uh, and following up to what President Tajani has just said, uh, I want to tell you the uh, results uh, of a survey that was made in uh, uh, different uh, member state, sa states uh, uh, in the uh, uh, University uh, of uh, Florence. As uh, Mr. Moavero said, Mr. Moavero said uh, we uh, ask more and more to the European Union with the same budget that we had in the past uh, and uh, uh, with the lower contributions uh, by uh, the member states uh, with no UK contribution in the future. We want to do more uh, in the field of defense uh, and not only. That reminds me of a joke of a film by Woody Allen uh, on the way we citizens uh, see the European Union. There was this honey hole, uh, a film by Woody Allen, where the two characters uh, in the end uh, uh, want to go to a restaurant in New York uh, and uh, they eat very badly, very poorly. It was impossible for them to eat in that restaurant. And in the end, uh, uh, they say, and the portions are very little. And oftentimes, when we talk about the European Union, it's the same thing. We ask uh, for something which is contradictory. We no longer want the European Union, but we ask uh, for more from the EU. This is why it is very difficult uh, to meet the needs of a wider budget, uh, enabling the EU, as uh, uh, Minister Mojavero said, uh, to uh, uh, strike a balance uh, between uh, budget discipline and the ability uh, to promote the economy of the European Union. In this survey that was made uh, in the different member states, uh, there was a question, as in, uh, should the EU or the member states uh, uh, increase their resources? Southern European countries, the majority of Southern European countries were in favor of more resources for the EU and less for the member states. In all the other member states, it was exactly the opposite answer. In the center, in the north of Europe, the majority of member states said fewer resources to the EU to give more resources to national budgets. With the interesting exception of Germany. In Germany, there was a slight majority in favor of having fewer resources in the German budget, but more resources allocated to the EU budget. And then we also asked another question. Are you in favor of a European tax on financial transactions to increase the EU budget? Or are you in favor on a tax on major digital uh, companies? The largest majority in all member states was in favor. If the question is not asked to the citizens, do you want to have more money for the EU or the member states? or? But is, are you in favor of a European tax on large digital companies? More than 70% of member states are in favor of that. So the way politicians and the European Union will present this issue will be of the utmost importance. Now, let's continue uh, with the second topic. I'll try to be short in my questions because we want to rather hear you our panelists, and we'll try to be short in our answers too. So the second topic concerns migration and the crisis of migration, migratory flows and refugees in Europe. I have three very practical questions. First, how can we manage the relation between migration and refugees? 
In the political debate, the two things are often misunderstood. We misunderstand uh, the uh, obligation towards the refugees uh, with the obligation towards all the economic migrants. And talking about the problems of migration, we try to put an obstacle to the topic uh, and to the issue of refugees, which is an international and moral duty for us all. So the first question is, uh, how can the EU uh, uh, better make a difference between these two phenomena, which needs to be governed in the different ways? So on the one end, uh, economic migration, and on the other, refugees. The second question is the following. Is this uh, a real pro still a real problem today? We know that uh, recently uh, we have had uh, 70,000 people come into the coasts of the European Union. Maybe it doesn't seem to be a very significant number uh, uh, leading uh, to uh, the request for a bigger effort from the European Union. If we compare what's happening in Venezuela, for example, I have no relation with Maduro in Venezuela. Huh? I want to be clear on that. So in recent months in Venezuela, there were 2 million people escaping from that country, from Venezuela. Colombia alone received 1 million refugees or migrants. So the second question is the following. Is it still a real problem or uh, not? And if the problem is still real, is it not going to be a problem related to the integration policies of some of these migrants or refugees? It's not a problem in terms of number of people coming to the European Union, but a problem related to how to integrate uh, people now, migrants now living in the European Union. Third question. The lack of solidarity in Europe today is clear. It is yet another example of the consequences uh, uh, resulting from the lack of mutual confidence among member states. However, the responsibility for this lack of solidarity, OK, is that a responsibility for the European Union or just a responsibility for some member states? In Italy, some people put the blame on Brussels for some issues which are within the competence of uh, member states and not Europe. Oftentimes, the countries which most criticize the consequences of migration and the crisis of refugees in Europe are those who are not ready to welcome refugees. So how can we solve that? Can European institutions solve problems? Or is this rather a problem related to the relations between the governments of the different member states? So what can Europe do in this context? First question, migrants and refugees. Clearly, it's two totally different things and two totally different conditions, although economic migrants uh, have problems uh, at home in their countries of origin. We've had uh, basically two types of refugees in recent years. Uh, refugees uh, uh, resulting from uh, the Syrian war, uh, um, with uh, uh, thousands and millions of people uh, fleeing uh, Syria and Iraq uh, due to the civil war and uh, due to the attack of ISIS. Millions of people uh, moved uh, to find a shelter in Europe. Then 
There are also people fleeing from some parts of Africa due to the terrorism perpetrated by Boko Haram due to the war uh, between Ethiopia and Eritrea, which uh, seems uh, fortunately to have come to an end with a new leader. There was an interesting article in an Italian newspaper, Avenire, uh, on the new leadership in Ethiopia. And um, we cannot uh, prevent from welcoming these people. They don't think about the fake refugees. Some weeks ago, uh, I visited the UN Center, uh, UN Center in Niger, in Myanmar, uh, where there were more than 1,000 people. The largest majority of them uh, had a cross across their neck. They were from Ethiopia or Eritrea. They already had the refugee stages, and these girls had to be redistributed uh, among other countries in the world. There are some countries uh, saying that they want to defend uh, uh, the Christian roots of Europe. I don't think that for these countries, these people represent a danger for our civilization. On the contrary, these are the people that uh, can uh, integrate better than any other. I try to read the gospel. And uh, reading the gospel, we see that Jesus uh, ascends uh, the uh, uh, criminals far away out of the temple. But uh, this is not the only kind of Jesus we have. Uh, Jesus is much more than that. Many people show the rosary, saying that uh, this is uh, a true symbol, just like the gospel. But... In the rosary, uh, there's also somebody on the cross, uh, and there's a face of suffering. If we do believe in the gospel, and if we, if we want to be Christian politicians uh, who believe in the Christian roots and traditions of uh, Europe, we can not only see Jesus sending criminals out of the temple, we, only have to see the we also have to see the face of Jesus suffering. And each one of those girls telling me enormous cases of violence uh, uh, before their fathers and brothers who were killed if they tried to uh, do something against that. Uh, there's the face of Christ. If we do uh, believe uh, uh, in uh, the Christian face of the people fleeing from Mosul, uh, we cannot prevent from welcoming them. This is our duty. And I'm mesmerized. I'm struck that countries like Poland and Hungary insisting on their Christian identity, focusing on their Christian identity, have no courage to welcome uh, uh, Christians uh, fleeing from their countries of origins because they don't want to give up their own identity. It would have been much easier for them to convert into the jihadist Islam rather than escaping their countries. Solidarity is lacking, true. But how many men and women of Eastern countries at the time of communist dictatorship and when Cardinal Mizzenti was jailed, how many of them were helped by the Italians, the French, and the Germans? And at that time, we used to help them because we did believe in solidarity. Therefore, solidarity must be mutual. If we uh, want uh, solidarity to be accepted and applied uh, by all uh, uh, European member states when we want uh, everyone to apply the reform of the Dublin Treaty, imposing the relocation of all refugees uh, um, among all the European member states. Uh, we're only asking for them to choose uh, in favor of solidarity. The Christians from Ethiopia or Eritrea, from Iraq or from Syria, uh, are not going to endanger the Christian identity of Hungary or Poland. Certainly not. That does not imply that uh, we want to give up uh, or that we want uh, uh, to let in everyone. 
illegal migrants are a totally different things. Uh, migrants uh, who are criminals uh, or those who want to integrate are, do, are a different thing. Uh, uh, migrants coming to do jihadist propaganda uh, or uh, doing drug, drug trafficking are a different things. Uh, I'm for the harsh line. I'm a hardliner. If they want to integrate uh, into Europe uh, and Italy, they have to learn the language, they have to comply with our rules like any other citizen, but at the same time, they must have the same uh, uh, trade union rights uh, as all the other workers. We need to uh, implement a serious integration policy. There can be uh, uh, corridors uh, uh, bringing qualified people into Europe. We cannot open up our doors to everyone, certainly not. There is a, a, a sometimes a, a social perception is more dangerous uh, than uh, uh, the reality. The murder occurred in Ma uh, Macerata uh, was enormous. There were four Nigerians who killed that girl very violently. And uh, that drew the media's attention. The murder was very harsh, and that created, uh, uh, that raised a lot of concerns among the people. So, there is uh, on the one end integration, and then on the other, migratory flows. flows. We do need to uh, solve the problems in Africa. I visited the UN Center in Myanmar. I went to Niger, too. Thanks to the actions promoted by the European Union, uh, 1 billion euro were allocated to that country. So we shifted from uh, 300,000 people going through Niger to go to Libya to Europe in 2016 to 10,000 people only in 2018. So. A 90% reduction, more than that, because we worked in Africa. We need to work in Africa. Let's uh, consider the climate change, uh, the demographic growth, uh, the wars, Boko Haram, the poverty in Africa. In 2050, there will be 2.5 billion Africans. In uh, uh, 2100, there will be 5 billion Africans. So uh, there will be uh, enormous movements if problems are not solved. When there will be a, a radical movements of the population, we need changes. Otherwise, we, uh, all the Coast Guard operations, all the police uh, operations will be totally useless. Uh, the largest army of uh, history, the Roman uh, army, uh, didn't block uh, people uh, uh, coming from the east to come to the west. Therefore, the Af African policy is of the utmost importance, as well as Mediterranean stability and stability in the Middle East. And uh, this is also connected to the loss of the Christian presence in the Middle East. Everyone says uh, that uh, uh, they are uh, Christians, but no one worries about the church, the Christian world, suffering uh, uh, in the Middle East. These are the most ancient Christian communities. They risk disappearing. And this is not just going to be a damage for them, but for the stability of that area. Because Christians in Palestine and in Syria were always uh, very important in terms of balance and dialogue with the Islamic world. If uh, those communities uh, disappear, if they have to abandon the countries of origin, their, their land of origin, it will be an enormous disaster. Because uh, they don't only play a religious role, uh, but uh, they also play a role in terms of peace and stability. And we have the duty not to forget uh, the church is suffering. We don't have to forget it in Egypt, nor in Turkey, nor in Syria, nor in Iraq. And this is not just connected to religion, but it is first and foremost a political issue, which is also connected to the uh, migration flows. So Europe must have a migration strategy. We need enormous financial tools. We need a vision. The migration policy does not just mean blocking 200 or 300 people. 
it is right to make uh, a European institution, uh, European institutions, or especially European member states, to understand that they have to do the same th something. Especially uh, Eastern European countries, the solidarity is not uh, just for them, but also solidarity that they have to give to Europe. They have to do something. They have to play a role. Welcoming 2,000 refugees does not change the geopolitical situation or the uh, identity of Hungary or Poland. So member states have to be responsible for that. Enzo Mavero was uh, uh, present uh, during the last European Council. At that time, we uh, uh, met uh, with uh, the Prime Minister, the Italian Prime Minister Conte, before the meeting. We um, uh, shared a, a joint action so that the member states could uh, approve the Dublin reform. There was uh, uh, a strong debate. Uh, many uh, countries were in favor. At the end of the Council, uh, we decided to approve the reform within the end of the year. Hopefully, countries from Eastern Europe since uh, we can vote by majority will not block uh, this process. Had there been uh, the Dublin reform today we wouldn't be here to discuss the ship uh, that uh, was in Catania and that uh, couldn't uh, let the 150 migrants go down. The problem would have been solved. All of them would have been relocated uh, to other member states. This is what the European Parliament fought, fought for. And this is the position, the stance uh, supported by Italy, by France, Germany, Spain. So Hungary and Poland should play their role because they got a lot, they received a lot from Europe. And since they want to defend the European identity, I think that they should do much more than uh, what they're doing uh, uh, this year and this month uh, to contribute to the solution of a political problem which risks, like employment, uh, to uh, change uh, the um, uh, a political uh, situation in imbalances in Europe. Talking about migrants has become extremely difficult. The last time it happened to me personally to talk publicly of migrants was uh, a few weeks ago in Belgium, in Marcinel. the place where a tragedy occurred uh, 62 years ago. 136 Italians died there in a, ma in a sort of, uh, they were minors, and together with the other casualties of our um, nationalities, and there were, I mean, most of them uh, migrants, uh, and they died uh, in a mine, and I think we've forgotten the history of our migrations, and I think that it was very bad that we forgot that, because we should always start from uh, reality in order then to look at today's reality. We should always go back to the realities we experienced. Uh, well, today we see epochal migratory flows that are totally extraordinary in terms of numbers, uh, in terms of origins, in terms of impact that they have. These uh, sort of flaws uh, come uh, from the south of the world towards the north of the world, but not only. In southeastern Asia, for instance, we also have uh, other flaws uh, towards Australia, and this is not the first time that this happens in the history of the world, but still, it seems that today we're faced with something new, totally new, and especially at European level, we are unable to face that together. We need to confess mutually 
a certain European absence. Uh, all in all, I mean by that European Union, its institutions, and the governments of its member states with respect to the governance ability and management ability of these epochal migratory flows. So this absence is uh, quite striking, especially if we think about uh, the economic and financial aspects, because, uh, well, the European Union, when it comes to its rules, is very much present in our lives uh, through economic matters, but here, on the contrary, it's rather absent. And um, the EU, first off, made a distinction between refugees, and for them, there are specific uh, asylum seekers' rules in order uh, for the uh, asylum to be acknowledged uh, for those who escape uh, wars, conflicts, uh, and uh, tragic situations of oppression. And then we have new forms of migrants that are called, for instance, economic migrants. So when it comes to granting the status of a asylum seeker, well, I mean, in the past, these people were in quite limited numbers. And so usually the rule was uh, the first country where these people used to arrive was the one that had to deal with the specific asylum-seeking uh, procedures. But then uh, with uh, the increase uh, of uh, these numbers, uh, this burden for the Arab countries becomes very high, too much high. So that's where European solidarity should come into play. That's where sort of burden sharing should come into play. But instead, it is exactly there that we have been faced and we are still faced today with uh, a number of uh, sort of closures and fences uh, of uh, national uh, forms of shelfishness because, uh, I mean, uh, there are some states that seem not willing, totally unwilling to accept the arrival of these people from outside Europe, people that are looking for a shelter are looking for protection if asylum seekers or simply look for a better future. And as a consequence, uh, it's uh, totally impossible to manage European migration policy. And this poses a big, big problem because uh, this leads us to the second part of my answer. Is that a real problem or a perceived problem? Well, actually, it's a real issue that has been uh, magnified and amplified by a certain perception because there is a clear sensation that there is no control and no management of such a big issue. And the absence of management is something that occurs at the European level and then uh, sort of has cascade effects because then each state has to respond. But if each uh, state responds autonomously, well, then that will become uh, the sort of denial of the very same concept of European Union, without forgetting the moral denial of the EU pre-existing concept of a European community. Well, a community that does not share can't be defined as a community. So faced with such a situation and scenario, very often we hear sentences like, but Europe hasn't got the right tools and so on. But let's be careful. Um, I don't want to sound too technical. On the contrary, I simply want to convey to you basic information. I mean, it is not true. European treaties foresee and set forth rules on according to which European institutions, as well as European member states, uh, uh, to adopt uh, regulations and measures and take solution and adopt uh, measures. So that was uh, a specific choice uh, to sort of uh, proceed like that and try to have a more shared approach. But this has to do only with the 
sort of uh, asylum right holder. Why haven't we considered, for instance, for people coming out of Europe to work here? Why haven't you worked on uh, external, commonly managed border controls? Why do we consider external state borders as a sort of state borders and not a commonly shared European borders? So you see, there is a blatant contradiction with those founding values that we love to quote when we talk about uh, Uh, solidarity, communion, sharing the big values of the EU. So this is a blatant contradiction. So over these years, we could have simply issue more rules and uh, give the EU more effective uh, uh, tools. But that was not done over the last four years. Uh, the uh, heads of uh, states uh, sort of met twice. Uh, the first time in June 2014 to talk about this. Well, some guidelines were set forth, but that was it. Nobody followed them, and specifically no concrete action was then taken. So specific indications were given in June 2014. So it's not a sort of accidental uh, date. It was uh, a few months after the casualties in front of the Lampedusa coastline, so the tragedy of migration had become so much visible, but very little was made apart from beautiful uh, words. And then in June 2018, recently, another big, big uh, meeting was carried out. So there were important declarations that were issued that have to do with decisions of European leaders that talk about sharing, shared effort, common approach, and so on and so forth. And uh, this is uh, what, uh, I mean, we have tried to apply in the following months. Uh, well, there were sort of some uh, situations in which the arrival of migrants on European coasts led to the sharing, more or less, and the distribution of these people even before assessing their status to with uh, several countries then to make the checks. But then, you see, this is not a sort of consolidated practice, and it's very, very hard to somehow turn all that into more concrete measures. So what does that mean? That means that we have to understand that uh, For instance, uh, the people arriving on the Italian coasts, uh, if we we'll look at the last five, six, seven years, we had so many people coming to our coasts uh, and the people that try to take the central Mediterranean route. And uh, some people say that uh, from seven to 10 percent of the arrivals uh, have to do with asylum seekers as a real refugees. The remaining 90% are not at all asylum seekers and not at all people who have the right to ask for the status of uh, asylum seeker. And so what should we do? I mean, if there are no job offers, uh, I mean, they should uh, be brought back to their countries of origin. But well, to do so, you need special agreements uh, with the countries of origin. So it's not uh, as easy, I mean, as one, two, three. We need to see if these people have papers, uh, if these people can be welcomed. There are uh, sort of uh, hosting and sheltering costs. We can't play with geography. Oh, the central Mediterranean. So is populated by a peninsula that is boot shaped. Well, it's their problem then. So it's up to you. You manage to sort of sort it out. No, I'm sorry. They do not get only to Italy or to Greece or from time to time to Spain. They are coming to Europe. So it is Europe that should respond to this uh, problem. And when I say Europe, I say, first of all, the governments of the European states and secondly, the European institutions. So We would like to see the European Commission to submit a, a sort of uh, proposals for uh, new 
laws and regulations. We would like to discuss about that. We would like to go beyond the case by case uh, uh, methodology. Sometimes you can find solutions, sometimes not. We're talking about people. So it is uh, clear that not finding solution means uh, having to do to cope with very dramatic situations. Well, that's sad that there is an additional remark to be made. We should not act simply by looking at the uh, outlets of migratory flaws. We should also look at the inlet, so at the source, so upstream and not just downstream. So we should focus uh, on the countries of origin of these migrants, so to see if these countries are at war, then Europe should struggle for sort of uh, peacekeeping uh, opportunities. I mean, what does uh, Europe uh, make for peace in the Middle East? Well, President Tajani uh, talked about Christians in the Middle East. But do we do anything like that? Uh, do we do anything when it comes to uh, peacekeeping and peace bringing? Well, we have uh, dictatorial and uh, authoritative regimes from which many people fly away from. Is there any form of uh, European coordination? And then we have uh, sort of people leaving their countries because the socioeconomic situation is too difficult. Well, and then uh, European action for investments in these countries is uh, effective enough, is not enough to send money there and uh, to make these countries grow, because sometimes they're also very densely populated. Well, health issues have slightly gone down. We also need to uh, be able to use these funds properly. So the Marshall Plan metaphor that you used is very effective. But let's not forget that the Marshall Plan worked because uh, the countries uh, sort of uh, that uh, had been set free by other regime were able to use uh, honestly and effectively these funds. So that's it. So you see, European action uh, to manage migration is just, just about uh, uh, what to do of these or those people who have come here. It is something that needs to be planned and organized much, much more upstream, starting from the countries of origin down to the transit countries where these people should be assisted and sometimes helped to go back. We need also to fight against human traffickers, to fight against these sorts of neo-slavery-like organizations that somehow sort of bring to the seriousness of the situation and uh, increase uh, the desperation and exploit these people. Because if uh, you make uh, these people come illegally to us, means to expose them to exploitation. We need to act effectively and uh, not uh, Uh, in a, a sort of neo-colonial way. No, not at all. We need to help these countries grow and fix their problems. If Europe really wants to be consistent with the values that are constantly repeated in the founding treaties of the EU and before that of the European Community, we need together to think about solutions to fix the situation. We should n- not leave... Uh, alone anybody, not Greece, not Spain, not Italy. And uh, even though migration flaws uh, were to arrive from the east, uh, eastern countries should be supported. The same applies to north. So if we stick to fences, because first of all, we have walls in our hearts, in our souls, and we will keep uh, being absent and we will keep conveying this sensation of total inability of Europe to cope and face positively uh, one of the most important issues of our times. Well, I want to 
sum up with a remark coming from uh, the title, real problems are complex. And as we've just heard, we can't uh, fix them with jokes or treats. To be happy, our heart, our needs that have to do then with very practical things, development, budgets, migratory flaws, are complex. And the solutions require something that has to do with happiness, that is a balance, ability to, to talk, to dialogue, say, being focused and objective. And so exactly the opposite of what we hear every day. Instead, we heard it here. We need people talking, exchanging, being rational, being objective. No easy promises. When Churchill became prime minister during the Second World War, he promised uh, so blood and tears. We can't continuously promise solutions that are miracle solutions, simply saying that uh, those uh, who came uh, afterwards are just uh, stupid people and the savior has come. Next year, we're going to mark also the anniversary of the French Revolution, 1789, 2019. So when you cut the hat of uh, who has come before you, well, then it will be soon your turn. So let's be careful. And now we're going to have uh, the uh, conference uh, with the head of the World Muslim League. Thank you very much. So you can stay in this room. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.